Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to be joined by Northfield Mount Hermon's head coach, Michael Shelton. And Michael has a unique experience. He grew up in Indiana, uh, being a top player there in the state, and played D2 at Bellarmine University. And then he's coached at Governor's Academy, Williston Northampton, and now he's at Northfield Mount Hermon. During that time, he also coached at Wesleyan University, University of New Haven, and Winthrop University. That's prep school, D3, D2, D1. And we talk about all the differences um, in those different levels, what he learned that he's bringing to the prep school world, um, about exposure, college recruiting, et cetera, et cetera. So really had a good conversation with Mike. I think you guys are going to like it. Thanks so much for tuning in and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Corey, for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, one of the reasons I want to have you on is you recently got hired uh, last year to Northfield Mount Hermon, which is a storied basketball program in school. Tell us a little bit about the school and tell us a little bit about your program and your philosophy. Yeah, so Northfield is definitely a storied program when it comes to New England prep basketball and prep basketball all over the, con- all over the country, honestly, Corey, as you know. Um, the school is 650 kids. It's co-ed. It's in the beautiful hills or mountains uh, of the uh, western side of Massachusetts and Gill, Massachusetts, uh, that my fiance likes to call it. I call it Mount Hermon because we have two different addresses. But um, so, yeah, so, you know, 650 kids, co-ed, uh, over 20 sports. Um, basketball has kind of been synonymous with ex- excellence here uh, for the last 15 to 20 years, you know, Um and largely in part because of, you know, Bill Batty that started it and John Carroll that picked up after him. Um, both of those guys were trailblazers in, in New England and prep basketball and prep sports in general. And, um, you know, we've really been able to market ourselves as the, you know, the Ivy League or the Ivy School of prep. Right. And I think John did a great job of that, being able to, to partner the educational aspect of the school, uh, how kids grow socially, emotionally uh, and on the basketball court. So. You know, for me, taking over a program like this, we've definitely tried to continue that tradition and and market ourselves to to clients and students and athletes that, you know, value the educational aspect as well as the, the high level basketball as well. Yeah, love it. And this is your third stop in the prep school world, which we'll get to your other stops here in a little bit. But tell me and people listening, what makes New England prep school basketball so special? Wow, that's a great question, especially coming from an Indiana guy that has nothing, you know, we don't know much about prep basketball back in the Midwest. Um, You know, what makes it special is I think that you really get a chance to um, hone in on your skills, get away from the distractions, uh, learn all of these other intangibles as an athlete that you're going to have to translate into college. Uh, time management, um, doing your own laundry, uh, you know, coming up with your own schedule all while trying to play high level basketball. So I think that the experience in the, in the boarding school market uh, in arena definitely prepares kids for college in that way. Also, you get a concentration of talent, right? So all of these kids have an opportunity to compete against each other at all these different levels. And they're all aspiring like you to play at the next level. So I think that creates a different environment for prep basketball in New England as well. I think those kind of um, factors uh, really uh, make it advantageous for families and students uh, to look into this opportunity because every state, unfortunately, isn't Indiana, right? Um, And so, you know, your state might not necessarily have a robust uh you know competitive competitive type of climate right you might have two or three different levels and the school that you go to is like a smaller level school so you don't get challenged and pushed on the court um and so you might want to be finding that day in and day out opportunity uh to compete at the highest level and kind of like piggybacking off of that because there's a concentration of talent 
in your own, on your own roster, you're going up against college level players every single day, which is totally different than a normal traditional public school where you're bringing in the middle school kids in the program, coming into the ninth grade program, a JV program. And you might have three or four guys in your entire program that are going to play college level basketball. Uh, a lot of guys that are really passionate about it and excited about it, but you're not going to be able to get that iron, you know, sharpens iron uh, opportunity like you will in prep school basketball, you know, at some states, in some states, in some high school situations. So that's another one of the reasons why families might want to look into this opportunity. Yeah. And you're from Kentucky where my dad grew up and all my family played basketball. And I grew up in, uh, or you grew up in Indiana. I grew up in Kentucky just across the river. Yeah. And I was right. actually talking to a Kentucky high school coach right before this interview. And we're talking about one of his kids to be a prep school candidate for a post-grad year. And he went on a D1 visit to Moorhead State this week, but mm -hmm. That's about it. Indiana, Kentucky only have so many coaches within a regional area that are going to come see that kid, you know, if they're not a top 200 player in the country. Right. But talk to me about the benefits of New England. And we've had discussed this ad nauseum on this podcast about that being a benefit of the exposure you get to college coaches in New England. But talk to me about your perspective, because you have coached in three prep schools. You have also coached in Kentucky and Indiana high school ball. So you've seen both perspectives. Give me your point of view and give the pitch to families on your thoughts on college exposure at the prep school world. Yeah. I mean, Corey, you do such a great job on this, on this podcast, like highlighting the opportunity that, you know, families have coming to new England because of that. And I'll give you a quick example, you know, at park Tudor, when I was there um, in Indianapolis, I mean, Indiana. Yeah. In Indianapolis five or six years ago, I had a kid named Kobe Webster who was absolutely dynamite, right? Kobe was a high level player. I felt like he could play, you know, mid-major plus basketball and his recruitment just wasn't to be found. You know, he ended up um, getting a scholarship offer to Western Illinois. Um, they had a really tough year, but he started and was like, you know, rookie of the year in that league and, you know, scored 17 points a game, ends up finishing his career at Nebraska. Right. So clearly Kobe was a talented player. It's just the opportunity uh, in that area, for some reason, you know, coaches either look outside the area or there just isn't enough um, schools to pull from in terms of colleges to pull from that, you know, he got an opportunity to, to showcase his talent, you know, and you juxtapose that with New England, where we have such a concentration. And so I don't know the number, but there's so many colleges at so many different levels and, you know, four or five state radius that you're always going to be able to be uh, seen. You're always going to have a, a showcase opportunity. You're always going to have a coach in your gym when it comes to, um, you know, your, your open gyms in the fall, because there's just so much talent here and there's so many opportunities in terms of, uh, you know, college coaches. And there's a lot of competition for those college coaches. So they're going to really, you know, circle the wagons to make sure that they know all of the talent in the area. Um, and it, again, it's really evident when you have kids coming from out of region that, you know, you might have a kid coming from out of region that doesn't have an opportunity like this kid you're talking about in Kentucky, where he's only looking at Moorhead State, you can come here and next thing you know, you know, we've got 15 different type of Moorhead State schools rather than Kentucky just having one, you know what I yeah. mean? Um, so there's just a lot more opportunity for kids because of the number of schools in such a short and, and enclosed radius, in my opinion. Let's talk about that even more. So you've got all the New England schools that are around the prep schools up there, but you've also got schools from every conference in America that make that pilgrimage every fall to New England. Yeah. Right. I remember Texas State years ago had like half their roster was prep school kids. And that's a random place, but it's still D1 because they made the time to make the connections. Right. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of our a lot of our coaches are really well connected. And I think from the time that I got in the league again, I'm, I'm dating myself, but like 10 years ago, or 11 years ago, whenever it was to now, there's so many more former college coaches that are now coaching in, in New England prep schools. So because of that, they have more connections. They're, they're reaching a broader audience when it comes to different coaches to say, Hey, I've got a kid that might fit your program to have them come in. And on top of the fact that when you look at uh, how we set up our showcases, uh, I think Adam Finkelstein's done a fantastic job uh, really highlighting New England basketball and being kind of the torchbearer when it comes to high level basketball, creating showcases and creating buzz. Uh, I think our NEPSAC showcases in June also create a really con a really high concentrated uh, opportunity for coaches to see a lot of talent in one um, centralized location as well. So I think those are the things that that really draw coaches into this because it's a one stop shop. 
You're going to have kids competing against really, really talented kids. You're going to have a large pool and you can really hit a lot of different um, kids on your list, on your board that colleges talk about in one location. So I think that's really what, you know, appeals our, our product and our opportunity to a lot of coaches across the country. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. Um, one thing I want to let families know, too, is you've got both ends of the spectrum. You've got your Putnam Science Brewsters that might get 200 coaches in, and then you've got your schools that might not have but one D3 walk-on on the team on that particular year, right? But college coaches will still come through. There might be five to ten in a fall period, but they're still going to come through just to keep up the connection with the coach, just to see if there might be a kid hiding out there. So your worst-case scenario, you've got the summer – live event with NEPSAC that they put on. And then you've got at least a couple coaches coming in to where this high school coach I'm talking to in Lexington probably won't see a single coach all year, even though he's got a talented team. Park Tudor. How many coaches came through Park Tudor when you were there? Not probably as many as here. Not as okay. many as here. You know, again, we had I had some some decent connections in the state, but again, maybe five, you know what I mean, throughout the fall. Um, maybe 10, you know, but it was, uh, it, again, it was like a, just a totally different situation. We had just lost Jaron Jackson. So, I mean, if Jaron was still there, I'm sure that there have been a lot more co coming through, but he decided to go to lot of mirror and, and do a prep year there in Indiana, Indiana uh, Northern Indiana. Yeah. Um, but with the kids that we had on the roster, really Kobe was our, our highest ranked player. Uh, we didn't have many at all. And like what you're saying, you know, is, is hundred percent true. I think, you know, you do have college coaches, um, keeping that relationship because they never know, you know, when you're going to have a kid uh, that, you know, that they're going to want to recruit. So they're up here anyway. And if I have an established relationship with a coach for 10 years or 13 years or 14 years, they're calling me saying, Hey, Mike, you know, I love, give me your open gym schedule. We're going to stop by. Um, and, it, and it definitely is a, a great beneficial relationship to the kids that I have in the program to get seen, you know, and I think that's what they want. They want to come here to have an opportunity to play in front of those type of schools and, and those type of coaches. So, um, yeah, again, some years you might have more talent than others. Like last year, you know, Corey, just to give you, again, put a fine point on this. You know, everybody thought that we were, you know, de-emphasizing basketball, not really going to be strong in basketball. But we still had 50 Division One schools in our gym in the fall, 50. You know, that doesn't that doesn't include the division two and division three schools that came also, you know, um, and that's over a two month period. So but still, you know what I mean? Our our kids uh, where we end up having three division one commits, um, they got an opportunity to play in front of 50 D1 schools, which I thought was pretty cool. And it's a chance. There's no guarantee those guys are going to offer, but it's more than you're getting at your previous school you're coming from. Exactly. It's a chance. And that's all you can ask for nowadays is that chance, that opportunity. That's it. Um, you coached at Governor's Academy in Williston, North Hampton, which are Class A. And now you're Northfield Mount Hermon Class AAA. Talk to me about the differences you've seen as now that you've been a coach at you know both class systems. Is there a difference? If I'm a parent and I'm looking at these schools, does it matter if it's AAA, single A, or should I look at the right fit? Yeah, no. I mean, again, and I just want to give you some kudos. I think you do a fantastic job highlighting this on all your podcasts and the conversations that I know that you have with your families. So Williston was class A and governors, believe it or not, was class B. And last year we competed in in AAA here at Northfield Mount Hermon. Um, and do I see a difference in um, those levels? There's a slight difference for sure. You know what I mean? I think that the the depth of talent is going to be different uh, from top to bottom in the league in triple A, as opposed to, you know, class B or class, class single A. Um, but I would tell you this at the top of those leagues, those three leagues, uh, it's not going to be a difference. There's not going to be a difference. You know, we just added, uh, rivers on our schedule this year. And you, you might look to say, why are you adding rivers? Well, they, they're, they won class B the last two years and they have everybody coming back from last year's championship team where they won by like 50, minus one kid that went to UMass, I believe. I could be wrong with that. And they've got multiple Division One player commits on their team in their Class B, you know? And so uh, for me, it's about having good games, having good competition and, and putting ourselves in position to compete against the best. And we want to compete against the best at every level. Um, but in terms of like talking to a family about the differences, it is really about the right fit, right? Um, I would say at class B and class in class A, you know, you might not have a team of 14 kids or 13 kids that are all going to go play college basketball. You know, you might have a, a, a team of six or seven or eight that might go play college basketball. Um, it really just depends on what you're looking for in terms of academic, what you're looking for in terms of location, what you're looking for in terms of coach and how he, how he's going to coach you and, and what style of play that they want to play. 
uh, in all of these different things um, that I think you have to go into what whatever the right fit is. Um, and then again, you have to think about, OK, you know, with double A AA and triple A, those those uh, programs are earlier in the, in the school year in terms of when they can start playing and practicing. Um, they have an opportunity to play more games. Um, they're, the length of the game is a little bit more in double A AA and triple A. So you have to go into those type of factors. The barriers to entry and playing time might be different at those schools as opposed to at A or B school also. So there's just a, a, a lot that goes into it. But I think there's definitely a misconception of like, you know, class B schools aren't any good or class A schools aren't any good. I tell you what, Milton Academy is a class A school this year. And we're playing them, them also this year. And again, they've got uh, a BC commit. They've got, uh, what is it, Princeton. I mean, again, I think they've got like five or six division one guys on their team also, and they're a class A school. So, and they're going to be very, very tough, you know, tough out. So um, again, at the top of each level, you're going to be, you know, you know, you're playing against the best of the best. And I think the top of each level in the enrollment division, which is what we call it here, can compete against double A and triple uh, A and give you another example really quick, Corey, like last year in double A, Cushing and, and Worcester Academy might have been the best teams in New England. You know what yeah. I mean? Worcester Academy is a double A team. And Jamie had a Duke commit. He had uh, Marquette. He had Georgetown. He had uh, Colgate and Stonehill um, was like his starting lineup at double A. And they beat South Kent at South Kent, you know, and South Kent was a fantastic team coached by Chills, who I know, you know. And then you think about Cushing who beat South Kent and Brewster last year as a double-A school. So again, you know what I mean? I, I think that level doesn't really matter to me in, 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 when it, in regards to like where a talented player should go. I really think that you should think about what your experience at that school is going to be like and what you want it to be like. And, um, you know, I think competition is going to begin itself, right? You're going to be in a competitive environment wherever you go and you're going to have to compete, you know, and that's what I talk to recruits about. Are you willing to compete? Because if you're not willing to compete, then you shouldn't come play for me because I'm not telling you that you're going to come here and start or play 25 minutes a game. Yeah. And I love it. Let's go back to what you said about playing time, double A, triple A starting earlier, more games, more minutes per game. Does that matter? I mean, you tell me, is that something I should look at if I'm a family? If I like a single A school and a double slash triple A school, and I'm looking at them both, you know, I still, my, my thesis sentence, Michael, is always, you go to the place where, you know, you connect with the coach the best, right? Minutes or not. But you tell me, how important is more opportunities to get on the court and play versus maybe going to a place you don't play as much, but you like to coach more? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I would say, what's the what's the place where you're not going to play as much? What's their player development strategy is what I would say to that family. Right. And that's the conversation that I would have, because if you go to a place that you love the coach and you're not going to play as much, but yet you're going to grow in opportunities and areas like an individual instruction and in practice more than you would the other place. Um, I think that you really have to take value in that um, as opposed to going to a place where you're going to play a lot, but yet you might not have um, the ability to grow as a player as much as you would under that coach. Right. Um, and I think that kids and families really get um, it's, it's a convoluted conversation because they really just see the playing time is like, oh, like I can go do my thing as opposed to like, what are the skills that I need that are going to need to be translated into college basketball? Because that's ultimately what all these kids want. Every kid you talk to probably, Corey, says they want to play Division One. You know, you have a really wide breadth. Maybe you talk to kids that are like, no, I really want to play D3. I tell you what, I've been doing this a long time, and it's rare that I've ever talked to a kid that's like, hey, coach, I really want to go to X D3 school. You know, it's like every kid says, my dream is to play Division One. you know. And so with that being said, it's like, how are you going to learn those transferable skills that are going to take your game from a high school player to a college player and play right away and not have to sit at that college in that environment that you're going to be in, in terms of high school, might look different. You might not play 25 or 30 minutes a game. You might play 15 or 10, but yet you're going up against better guys in in, um, in practice every single day. The coaching staff is fantastic with their player development strategy for you. They watch a lot of film. How they how they prep how they prepare is exactly how you're going to have to prepare and play in college, and that's going to get you ready for that next college opportunity. So I think those are some things that uh, you have to really think about. Yeah, it's the whole quality versus quantity debate, right? Which you can put to lots of aspects in your life, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Exactly, I totally agree. Okay, you've coached at the college level. D3 at Wesleyan, D2 at New Haven, and D1 at Winthrop. And how, what did you learn from, from that coaching experience in college that helps you now in your prep school job? 
Yeah, I mean, I love that question, Corey, because to be, to be honest with you, I couldn't have had three different ex more like different experiences, I would say, in terms of the head coaches that I worked for. So, you know, at Wesleyan, I think that, you know, Joe Riley is still a mentor to me this day. He's a great person. He's a great man. He's a great leader of young men. And I think what I learned at Wesleyan at the Division Three level was first and foremost, again, coming from Indiana, coming from Midwest, where there's not many Division Three schools. And to be quite frank with you, growing up as a high school player, I never wanted to go play Division Three. I thought Division Three was this lower level basketball. I tell you what, the first thing that I learned at Wesley was there's some Division Three schools that can really hoop, you know, and some guys that can really play. And there's a lot of professionals at the Division Three level. I mean, back then when I was at Wesleyan, Dave Hickson was at Amherst, inducted into the Hall of Fame. Mike Maker was at Williams, you know, and they had their fantastic teams. And unfortunately, or, or fortunately for me, Joe always gave me those scouts. So I'm sitting here pulling out what little hair I had to try to figure out how to stop these guys at Williams and Amherst because they had some really talented guys. And so that was my indoctrination in, in terms of what high level basketball was, but also like the opportunity that the academic piece really gives you. And again, a kid coming up in Indiana, we didn't always have that at the forefront of conversations, which I think is really important for our kids' growth. So at Wesleyan, I thought I learned uh, that in terms of how competitive it is at the highest level in D3, but more so in terms of the coaching aspect, Joe does a fantastic job with our culture. Um, I think he's really, really player-centered and player-driven coach, and he really wants to create a great opportunity for his kids. And I think that I really learned the value of that uh, how to have conversations, how to create relationships with kids. And I think that's what I took away from, from Joe. Then I went to work with Ted uh, hoteling at New Haven. And like Ted is an absolute basketball savant, you know, when, whether it came from defense or whether it came from the offensive side, you know, he was really good friends with Mike Longombardi from, he was uh, back then he was on the Celtics staff and Mike will come in and do like a, a defensive clinic with us. And we did a lot of NBA type defensive strategies, but more so than that, like I think that Ted is really a savant when it comes to the offensive side of ball of the ball. And I really learned how to scaffold a, a, a basketball program when you're trying to build an offensive playbook, an offensive philosophy, uh, how you want to play and the building blocks of what you need to do on a daily basis, because he's maniacal with his preparation. And again, in games, in game adjustments for that guy, absolutely incredible. And there's no, the, the, there's definitely a strong correlation of, you know, the success that he's had at a place like New Haven, uh, because he's really, really a genius. So I really learned, you know, how to scaffold your overall philo offensive philosophy and breakdown drills and, and all the, the little things that, and the nuances that go into doing that in player development, how you really have like your player development based out of the concepts that you have offensively. And it kind of starts from the ground up, right? One-on-one, 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 et cetera, all the way up to five-on-five concepts. So uh, I had a really good opportunity to learn from him. And then um, at Winthrop with Pat Kelsey, you know, his success, that he's had since I've been with him is just like gone off the charts as well. And, you know, with, with Pat, I learned a lot um, just in terms of his preparation and how he treated Winter University. We, we were an organization that was a high major organization in the big South. Everything that we did was five-star, you know, everything, his expectations for us as a coaching staff was that of a high major coach. So our preparation, um, how we did recruiting, um, what the recruits saw, how we treated our guys, uh, how we prepared on the court. Um, you know, I think that I, I learned a lot of that aspect of like how to treat everything like, uh, again, like a high major program. I think for me in my specific role with that staff, I was a video coordinator. And um, I think I really benefited off of the amount of film that I had to watch and break down. Again, Pat, like uh, like Ted, maniacal with our preparation. And he really gave me ownership of that aspect of it. Uh, I watched a tremendous amount of film um, broke down a tremendous amount of film back then it wasn't a synergy thing. It was EXO. So I had to one, two, every single clip. And again, as a basketball coach, being able to like absorb all of the different concepts and me having to basically write our scouts and help our, help our assistants, write our scouts and how we're going to play this action or that action and get them prepared with all their clips and then present that to the guys as well. Like I had to do that for our team there. So I was the one presenting the material. I was the one up there in front of the guys. So at the division one, level I thought that I learned and grew a lot with that and I was able to kind of trend, uh, translate all of those different skill sets into my first program at Williston and um, I think I did a pretty good job those first two years doing that yeah you did 
And talk to me now because, you know, kids are so hell-bent on D1. Talk to me about the on-the-court differences, specifically between D3, D2, and D1 at the levels you were at. Yeah, and that's 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 a great question, too, because the Big South is considered like a low major level. Uh, and New Haven is a really talented, really strong uh, Division II league here in New England and throughout the country. Uh, and then the NESCAC, you know, is the highest, I think, is the best uh, Division Three conference in the country. You know, the biggest difference is going to be athleticism. And I know that you've talked to some other guys on the podcast about that. I think the skill sets are really, really similar. Guys that can, um, you know, get their shot off, make shots at a high level, create space and opportunity. I think those are the similar skills that kind of go throughout the levels. But I think the size of the player, the athleticism of the player, the quickness of the game, the pace of the game, it gets it gets different and, and you know, more violently um, a chasm as you go up in, in level. So I think that's the biggest really the biggest thing um and you see that in some of these now that you know the, the NCAA has shifted and changed the rules when some of these teams are playing each other that a lot of the lower teams not a lot but some every year you're gonna have a d2 team beat a division one team a division three team beat a division one team and people are like oh my gosh I can't believe you mass Boston beat Holy Cross and it's like hey man it's not that big of a difference you know what I mean <laughs> like it's a difference for sure but it's not that big of a difference yeah, absolutely. And what does it take for, I ask this to all the coaches, all right? What does it take for a guard to play at the D1 level? The first thing that I'm going to say, Corey, is you have to be an unbelievable leader and communicator. You know, I think at uh, at every level you have to have that, but I think especially at the Division One level, you have to be a, a great leader of, of, of your troops out there, of your teammates, um, be able to weather the storm. And you have to be able to, to do that. You have to be able to communicate at a really, really high level. You have to be an extension of the head coach, you know, and um, the seasons are long, the practices are long, um, you know, the workouts are long, um, all those things. It's really, really a grind. And so for you to be a, a guard at the division one level, I think that you have to be able to really uh, – um, lead your team through all of those different varying parts of the season. In addition to that, uh, to be a guard at the division one level, I also think that you have to find the right fit. I think that you talk a lot about that uh, with your clients and on your podcast, it's like every division one program isn't going to want the same thing in whatever guard that they have. Right. So some guard, some programs might be okay with the smaller guard because they're going to play a certain way, you know, other players and others, other programs, you might need to have, uh, you know, a size advantage. You know, some coaches might want skill where you can be a great passer facilitator. Other coaches might say, we're going to play through our point guard and we need them to be a high volume scorer. Um, some coaches are like, okay, it's okay if you can't shoot. But other coaches are like, I need you to be keep the defense honest, you know. And I think as our game evolves and, tra and, and tra you know, transitions into the future, I think that you are going to have to be more of a well-rounded player and be able to make, make shots at a high level and keep the defense honest. But I really think that, you know, to be a division one guard, ultimately it's about leadership and communication. And then from there, you have to find the right fit for whatever your skill set is. You know, if you're a great shooter, there's going to be programs you can go to. If you're, if you're a great defender, you know, 94 feet, there's programs you can go to. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's where the fit kind of comes in, in my opinion. Love it. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. Um, when you walk in a gym and you have no idea what ranking kids are and you see some, some pretty good ballers, can you tell Michael, like, oh, that's a D3 guard, oh, that's a D2 kid, that's a low, mid, high major. Do you have that yet? And if so, how, what do you look for? What do you, what stands out to you? Because I'm asking this for like kids that are in open gym or kids that are playing AU games and they're hoping to catch a coach's eye. Like, do coaches just have, see enough reps that they know right away, like that kid's a Winthrop kid or this kid could play at New Haven or this kid's Wesleyan kid. Walk me through just seeing a kid for the first time, not knowing a thing about them. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, that's that's what uh, separates the great coaches from uh, the not so great coaches, and that, that that's what separates the coaches that are successful at their level and not being able to walk in that gym and have that that uh, delineation of like this is a kid that you know could play play for me right away, play in my league. This is a kid that might be a little bit higher than than my league, but that's the kid that we're going to go after. Or this is the kid that's going to go to Michigan and you know Kansas, and there's no reason for me to waste my time. You know what I mean? And, 
I think for any coach to be able to figure that out quicker is what really differentiates coaches uh, in the coaching ranks. And I think the more time that you get in the business and having the business, I think the easier that is for you to kind of figure out. Um, and as again, as a head coach, I think that's also different too, Corey. And I know that you know this. It's, it's like as an assistant coach, I have to know what my head coach wants. And so mm -hmm. therefore, like I have to factor that into like me going to Peace Jam or me going to any of these AAU or open gyms to figure out, okay, like, what exactly is my head coach looking for? Where does he now? Where does that kid fit into that? And now what level is he? Is he too high? Is he too low? Is he just right? Et cetera. As a head coach, I'm looking, I'm looking at it through a different lens. Um, and to answer your question, like, can I definitively say, Hey, this is a D three head coach that's going to go to Williams or this kid's going to go to Keene state or this kid's, you know what I mean? Like this kid's going to go to center in, in Kentucky. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's going to be harder to do that as opposed to, you know, I think that this kid is a scholarship level kid. I think this kid is a division one kid, you know, and then you have to continue to watch him more, more times to figure out, okay, this is a low major plus kid. This is a mid major plus kid. This is a high major minus kid. Um, the more times you watch them to see how consistent they are, because the conversation that I have with my kids in my program is all of you guys can put up a division one highlight on Twitter or excuse me, yeah. on X or Instagram. All of you can. Everybody looks like a division one player in a highlight. The separator is your consistency in your habits, in your discipline and how you perform on a consistent basis. So when a coach comes in and watches you play, you're going to play at a certain level and then. The next time that coach sees you, are you going know, to play at that same level or higher? You know what I mean? And that's what's going to differentiate you to get that opportunity at the college level. And that's what I think is one of the things that's so great about guys like you, Michael, is you as a prep school coach see these kids every day, right? And you're going to be in this business a long time. So you're not going to call up a college coach at an inappropriate level and try to pitch your kid because that's only going to hurt your integrity for future kids. So if I'm a college coach and Michael Shelton at Northfield Mount Herman calls me up and says, hey... I've got a kid that I think can succeed on your team. I'm going to take a serious look at that and, and, and know that you can save me tons of time knowing that you're being, you know, kind of like, um, you know, bespoke in finding the right, you know, recruits for me. So to me, like during COVID, when Jerry Quinn was calling up coaches and they're like, well, we don't know Jerry, like Jerry Quinn's been doing this 40 years. I think the guy knows, I don't think the guy is going to steer you wrong. And it's just, if I was a college assistant, I, my role is actually just be prep school coaches pretty much and just say, yeah. hey, who could play here? Because you're not going to BS these guys. No, for sure. And you can't, like you said, right? Because the moment that you do uh, is the moment that you lose that connection and that relationship, which is the driving force in what we do here at prep school. You know, we have to be connected. We have to have relationships all across the country at all different levels. And the moment that you send a kid or send a, a program or a coach, a, a bad player is the moment where, uh, that relationship and that door closes and it might spread to other coaches in the coaching yeah. rank because you know, that, that stuff goes, goes fast. You know, your, your reputation is really everything. And so I do pride myself, uh, Corey, on, if you look at my, my, my history, that all of my kids play right away because I do pride myself on fit, you know, and while I've only had, you know, a handful, uh, you know, 10 or so division one guys, you know what I mean? And I've got a lot of D2 guys and a lot of D3 guys. It's like all my kids play right away because well, what I want is for my kids to have a great experience, you know? And so I'm looking for college coaches that I know are going to be good men, good leaders of young men, be good humans and care about the kid off the court and be able to coach the kid up on the court and the, the, where the kid can have success uh, in wins and losses because nobody likes to go to a team that isn't winning much. Um, that's just not a great environment, you know? So there's a lot of different factors in the fit that I talked to them about. But again, going back to, to what you were talking about originally is, you know, I have to be able to assess a kid's talent level and um, move forward through that. Now, there is there some conversations of stretch goals and everything else? I think as humans, we always need to have a stretch goal, right? So if I have a kid that comes to me and I evaluate him as a division three high level player, and yet he's telling me division one, he can have that division one stretch goal. And then it's my my responsibility and job to get division ones in the gym, like we talked about earlier. And that's where it's going to be the rubber's going to meet the road. You know what I mean? You're either going to be good enough for them or not. It's not going to be for a lack of opportunity. You said it, a chance, right? That's what we're looking to get these kids, a chance. So if they have a chance to play in front of 30, 40, 50 division one schools and none of those schools offer them an opportunity, then we can have a more um, honest, open conversation where it's like, look, this is what the market's saying. This is where your talent is 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 being asked for, and let's go from that per, that perspective and that point rather than 
I hope that I can play division one or I want to play division one. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Um, next up, what is something about college basketball that players and their parents just don't quite get that you <laughs> wish you could tell them like, Hey, by the way, I know you think it's like this. Here's a little insider's tip. You need to be aware of this or no one might talk about this. Yeah. But from your experience, I, mean, I think that, I mean, again, that's a really great question. I mean, I think that especially as uh, COVID, the transfer portal in NIL, like, I think that this has been times t t by 10. It's a business. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that that's really what parents and players understand. You know, even back when I played, back when you played, probably, right? Like, when we were in high school and scoring all these points and having all this success, you know, we thought that it was so much fun. And then we get into the, the business of college. It's a totally different experience because wins and losses determine a coach's, you know, future for their family and food on the table, you know? And so it just becomes a different environment, a different relationship. Um, and kids need to really understand that basketball is a billion dollar business. And, given the portal, given the fact that kids have extra years, given the fact that now there's NIL money going to certain kids, it is a business, right? And if you can't help that school's business, then you will not be recruited. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and I think that they need to under, they need to understand that and understand that um, it's not personal and it's gotten that much more competitive to get all of those spots because of the fact that it's a business. Yeah. Perfect. Um, what about, uh, BS high? Have you had a chance to watch that yet on HBO max? Say that again. BS high about the Bishop Sycamore football team. No, I haven't watched that yet. Is that a good but one? You have to watch it because it is about the Bishop Sycamore prep school. Um, yeah. that wasn't a prep school that got rolled by IMG on ESPN. And it turns out it was a pure scam that the coach is a criminal kids got ripped off. So the point is, you need to watch that. Everyone listening to this needs to watch that because that is what we are con – guys like Michael and I are constantly talking about with the prep schools versus basketball academy um, yeah. conversation. And this is a football academy, but it, it irks me throughout. They keep calling it a prep school. It's not a prep school. It's an academy. So I didn't know if you'd seen that or not, but it's um, it's it's just a great warning sign for for kids in the high school market looking to go to the next level. Yeah, not at all, but I'm definitely going to put that on my list. It sounds like a, it sounds like a good watch. Yeah, it is. It's 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 maddening. Um, you played at Bellarmine College, which is uh, in Louisville, right across uh, the river from Indiana, from where you grew up. Walk me through your high school days and why you ended up choosing Bellarmine, and who else were some of the choices that you chose Bellarmine over? Yeah, so you know, my high school uh, career was was definitely you know. A little bit different. It actually started in Louisville at, at DuPont Manual for a couple of years. And then we moved to uh, Jeffersonville across the bridge, uh, my mom and I. Um, and then I ended up attending uh, Jeffersonville. And, um, you know, at Jeff, uh, my high school coach was Mike Broden, who was the winningest coach in the state of Indiana from two from 1990 to 2000. Um, and um, so he had a lot of success. Uh, state championship with Sharon Wilkerson, early 90s. And then a final four early, early to mid nineties. And then our team went to the final four in 2000 um, and lost to a really good uh, Bloomington North team by the, on the last second shot. So, you know, my high school, uh, I tell everybody, like, if you watch Friday night flights or Friday night lights nights, you know, Friday night lights, excuse me, um, not a football guy, but Friday night lights. Uh, um, that's exactly how my high school experience was. We had 3,500 fans at every single home game sold out. Um, you know, we had a, a TV station that did every single home game, um, reporters, autographs. Um, it was crazy. We had our own private bus to take us to all of our games. Um, almost every game that we went to was sold out in high school. So, you know, my high school coach, Mike Broughton, like, you know, coach B would say, listen, like this is going to be as best as, as good as it's going to get for a lot of you guys. So you really need to enjoy it. And it was, you know, he was, it was true. You know, it was, it was the best for me. Um, and another thing is interestingly enough is like, you know, I started varsity as a sophomore. Um, you know, I was the same size as a sophomore that I was when I graduated six, six, super athletic, skilled, can shoot standstill threes. Um, and I was really ranked back then. Not really, you know what I mean? It's totally different than it is now, but like I was, I was really ranked and, and went to all the five-star elite camps and, 
made all the all-star games and I was getting recruited at the division one level, but I never grew. And I stayed kind of the same between sophomore year and senior year. And um, my, my recruitment totally shifted where I thought I was going to be a division one player and ended up like George Mason um, when Paul Hewitt was there, uh, excuse me, not Paul, not, not George Mason. Um, when, when Paul was at Siena and Cliff Warren and those guys recruited me, they were the last division one to recruit me. And in that summer, they ended up getting Georgia tech. So I wasn't good enough to go to Georgia Tech, um, clearly, and the new staff didn't know me. Um, and uh, I ended up having like basically Indianapolis, University of Indianapolis out of Indianapolis and Bellarmine be my my final two choices. Uh, and I ended up choosing Bellarmine because I went on a visit. I really liked the guys. Um, again, it was really close to home. And, you know, I just, I just kind of had a connection with one of the coaches there as well. So um, that's kind of why I chose it. And, and, it, and it, uh, interestingly enough, like I didn't finish my career there. Um, you know, I only played two, two years of college basketball and then I ended up doing something different, but um, it definitely was a good experience for me for a lot of different reasons. You know, being a full, full scholarship athlete was a dream of mine, even though it was like to be a division one guy, like, you know, being a full, full ride D two guy was really, really, really fun. And competing with my, my friends and my, my teammates was really fun as well at that level, because back then the GLVC, was the best division two school division two conference in the uh in the country you know and if you think about it bellarmine now is uh division one northern kentucky is division one um there was uh golly there's a couple other division ones that are that are that are there that i'm losing that i'm losing my memory now but i think four or five schools that were in our conference back then were division one um and back then kentucky wesleyan was the best division two school in the country um uh, with ray harper as the head coach uh, and another fun fact is that uh, my freshman year at USI, USI is Division One now too, because Bruce Pearl was there. So Bruce Pearl was the head coach at USI when I was playing. That tells you how old I am. And uh, and so yeah, it was a fun it was a fun experience in the GLVC for sure. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, is there anything you want to touch on that we haven't uh, talked about yet? No, I mean I think I think you did a great job. Um, you didn't give me the quick hitters. You know what I mean? I know they're I coming. About, they're but, right after this. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I gotta, I gotta tell everybody my, uh, my favorite movie, but anyway, uh, but yeah, no, nothing that we, nothing that we, you know, uh, I think we talked about a lot of different things, you know, my main thing for, for people out there listening is, you know, I think people like you are really important in the process. I think you do a fantastic job, uh, you know, weeding through some of the, 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 the murky waters that it comes to prep school basketball. I think that honestly, Corey, you always have your client's best interest at heart. And I think that you're really needed for our space. So um, I definitely encourage uh, families to, uh, to get with you to, to seek your counsel. Cause I think you do a fantastic job. Um, but besides that, you know, I think we touched on everything else. Yeah, thank you. And we've connected on our first client ever uh, coming up this year. So excited That's for it. that. All yeah, right, let's get to fun. the, yeah, let's get to the quick hitters here. Best player you've ever played against? Me personally, Sean May. It was that Final Four game uh, in high school. We were playing Bloomington, uh, Bloomington North. Sean was a sophomore at six ten, and I was a, a senior at six six and one hundred and ninety pounds, soaking wet. And Sean Moore gave me twenty seven, or Sean May, excuse me, Sean May gave me twenty seven, and um, I, I didn't really know who the kid was. I know his dad played at IU. And I was like, golly, this kid is good. And uh, he ended up going to North Carolina, having a pretty good career and going to the NBA. So that was uh, definitely the best player that I've ever played against. He really whooped, whooped my butt that game. I think okay. I had nine points that game in the final four game or something like that. He had 27. And uh, Jared Jeffries uh, also was on his team. And he had 20, 25 or 27 that game too. So um, those two those two guys were pretty freaking good. I can tell you that much. Pretty good high school team. Is that back when Indiana had one class? No, we were still, we, it was still 4A. We were still class, it was still the class system back there. Um, best player I ever played with was Jason Williams, who played at Duke, who's on ESPN. I think he's still with ESPN. I don't know. I know that it made some recent cuts, but uh, I played with, with Jason Williams at Five Star and Future Stars and, you know, had a nice summer relationship with him my uh, sophomore year going into my junior year, him, him going into his senior year. So I was there when Coach K and, and Chris Carroll were trying to recruit him at Five Star. And we made it all the way to the championship game at Five Star, played against Steve Blake. That was a fantastic opportunity and experience for me as a high school player. So the best player I played with was, was Jay Will for sure. He was absolutely lights out. Yeah. 
How about the prep school world? Who's the best player you've coached against? Um, I've coached against a lot of good players, uh, Corey. A lot of good how about, players. How about the one that lit you up? Like good player and also lit you up in a game. Um, well, I'll say that the best player that I've coached against is AJ DeBansta, who just transferred to prolific prep prep, I think. Um, I mean, that kid is is a first round, first round draft pick. You know what I mean? Like He's going to go number one, in my opinion. Like uh, he was an eighth grader and he didn't light us up. He had 15 as an eighth grader, but our team that year at Govs was really good. Um, and he played really, really well. Uh, and last year at Northfield, we played them again. And again, it's just the kids unguardable, essentially, you know, and the kid is super young, very talented, high ceiling. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that that was was is the most talented kid that I've coached against for sure. Okay. Favorite movie. <laughs> this is my favorite question because I know that people are probably going to think <laughs> I'm going to say a basketball movie. And, and, you know, I might, please don't air this in Indiana because if I'm not, if I don't say Hoosiers and they might not let me back in the state, but, uh, but actually my favorite movie is wedding crashers and um, I'm getting married on October 7th and I can't stop thinking about all the different scenes in wedding crashers uh, as my fiance and I get prepared for our wedding. But uh if it ever comes on, I'm always watching it. It always gives me a laugh. And uh, I think it's literally the best movie ever created, in my opinion. You know, ironic, one of my college classmates, like, they got married in San Diego in 2006. And we're all partying. It's a big bar in a hotel downtown San Diego. And there's just this guy there in shorts drinking. And it's like, <laughs> who are you? And he's like, oh, Bob. And it's like, did you get advice? Like, no. And the bridesmaids went nuts, like no. screamed at him and chased him out of there. <laughs> And I was like, wow, that's that's my first wedding crasher. And that was quite unlike the movie. <laughs> that's quite unlike the movie. Yeah, no, that's that's really funny. I've never seen it myself either. But uh, a guy in shorts drinking a drink in the middle of, of, the, of the, the, the dance floor must, must have been pretty funny. Yeah, he's probably just an alcoholic trying to get some free yeah. news or something. <laughs> um, what Final one, what's your hobbies when you're not coaching? Yeah, you know what, man? It used to be golf, you know. Um, when I stopped playing college basketball, I, I turned to golf I played high school golf and um basketball only and uh, I turned to golf and turned uh professional as like a teaching pro for five or six years mm -hmm. so like my early mid-20s to late 20s I played a lot of golf now I stink I can't get out there because of basketball and work but you know it used to be golf um you know I might you know I might yeah that's about it that's all no other okay. hobbies really. yeah. okay and where can people find you um if they yeah. want to reach out uh, on X, uh, Coach Shelton 25 at Coach Shelton 25, uh, on Twitter, you know, formerly known Twitter, but now X, uh, is Coach Shelton 25. And, um, yeah, I'm sure we'll put, you know, up in the show notes, we'll put the rest of the stuff up, but that's, that's where they can find me. Please reach out if you have any questions. I always tell families like, you know, again, talking about fit, my program might not be the right fit for you, but I would love to answer any questions about prep basketball. Um, you know, give you any guidance that I may be able to give you, um, at all whether again whether or not animation is your your right fit or not perfect well folks thanks for joining us today we have coach michael shelton from north of Mount herman on today and if you like what you hear and want to make sure you don't miss anything be sure to subscribe to the youtube channel where you have bonus content and you can always subscribe on all major podcasting platforms go to the website prepathletics.com and sign up there for the newsletter so you can get all good information once a month. And any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me. All my contact information is on the website and in 